Welcome to video number 16 for Physics 102. In this video, we do an example problem using the angular versions of the kinematic equations. At the end of class last time, we solved this version of our Rosetta Stone that connects our translation variables to our rotation variables. The end of class, you translated our kinematic equations in translational variables, v and a and y, into new versions using our rotational variables, omega, theta, and alpha. These equations, just like their translational brothers, can only be used under certain conditions. The rotational kinematic equations can only be used if the angular acceleration alpha is a constant. Let's try using these equations in the context of a problem. A disk spins counterclockwise with an angular velocity of 2 radians per second. When a motor begins to apply an angular acceleration of negative 4 radians per second squared for 3 seconds. The question is, what is the final angular displacement of the disk? Is it clockwise or counterclockwise from the position at which the motor began to apply the angular acceleration? The part B is, how far counterclockwise does the disk travel? What's the maximum counterclockwise angle that the disk travels through during this time that the motor is applying an angular acceleration? Well, let's begin focusing on the problem using, by sketching a useful picture. So here's our disk. I'm going to add a line to help us as a reference point. Our disk is initially rotating counterclockwise at an angular velocity of 2 radians per second. Now that we've got a useful picture, we can follow our problem-solving framework, and the next step is to begin to describe what's going on in words. Well, the disk is spinning counterclockwise, which means that the angular velocity is initially positive. At some time, there begins to be applied an angular acceleration that is negative. Now, we don't have a lot of experience yet with these rotational quantities, but there's a nice analogy to this particular situation. A ball being thrown straight up in the air. In that case, the ball begins with an initial velocity that is up, which we can call positive. And the acceleration of the ball due to gravity is down, which if up is positive, then down would be negative. We can use this analogy to determine what's going to happen in our rotational problem. So, the next thing the ball does is it comes to a stop. It's moving upwards, gravity's pulling it down, and at some point the ball comes to a stop at the top of its trajectory. Similarly, since the acceleration and the velocity are in opposite directions for this rotating disk, the disk will slow to a stop. Finally, for the ball, the, after it stops, it begins to move downwards with a negative velocity. The exact same thing is going to happen in our rotating disk. The, ex the disk has come to a stop, and there is still a negative acceleration. So the disk will begin to spin the other way, clockwise. Now that we've described in words what's going to go on, the next step in our problem-solving framework is to identify any approximations or constraints. Well, we know that the acceleration is constant, at negative 4 radians per second squared. This means we can use the kinematic equations that were introduced at the end of last lecture. We also know, following the ball analogy, that at its most counterclockwise angular displacement, the angular velocity of the disk will be zero. The disk will rotate counterclockwise, getting slower and slower and slower until it comes to a stop, and then begin to rotate clockwise. So at its most counterclockwise, at that instant, the angular velocity will be zero. Now we can move on to trying to identify what we're solving for. Well, in part A, we're looking for the final angular displacement of the disk, or what is the final angle of the disk after three seconds of time have elapsed. For part B, we're interested in how far counterclockwise does the disk travel, or using our approximations and constraints, we know that this is the angle at which the omega, the angular velocity, is equal to zero. Now that we've identified what we're solving for, we can begin to assign symbols to our diagram. Well, the first thing we can assign a symbol to is our initial velocity. We know our initial velocity is positive, 2 radians per second, because it's going counterclockwise, and we'll call our initial velocity omega naught, just like we've done with our initial linear velocities in the past. 
We're also given in the problem that the acceleration is negative 4 radians per second squared, which we will call alpha, as usual. The final symbol that I'm going to introduce is the initial angle. Now just like with a translation problem, I get to define the zero of angle to be wherever I like. I'm going to define the position at which the acceleration begins to be applied as theta equals zero. So we're going to call theta naught, which is the time at which the acceleration begins to be applied, we're going to define that to be zero radians. Now that we've got some symbols, we can start talking about what equations might be relevant for solving this problem. The approximations and constraints showed us that the acceleration was constant, and thus the kinematic equations in their rotational form apply in this situation. Because of our choice that the initial angle is defined to be zero, we know that theta naught is going to be zero in all of these equations, and we can just cross it out. The next step in our problem-solving framework is to plan a solution, and beginning with estimating roughly what kind of answers we suspect for our problem. For part A, both alpha and t seem large to compared to omega naught. So my bet is that the final angle will actually be zero, less than zero. The disk will s slow down, slow down, slow down, and then rotate backwards past its original position. So the final position will be a negative angle, or clockwise from where I started. For part B, we know that the angle must be positive, because the disk is going to turn counterclockwise until it stops. So our answer to part B better be positive. Now that we know roughly where we're going, we can start trying to develop a logical chain of equations to solve our problem. For part A, we're looking for the theta when t is equal to 3 seconds. We also know omega naught, 2 radians per second, the time, 3 seconds, and alpha, negative 4 radians per second squared is given in the problem. So we have everything for this equation, and we could just use this equation to solve for theta. For part b, we're also looking for a theta. And we still know omega naught and alpha. But this time, we know the final omega is equal to zero, because, as discussed in our approximations and constraints, at its furthest clock counterclockwise angle, the thing will come to a stop instantaneously before beginning to rotate back. So we know that the final omega for this part of the problem is going to be equal to zero. Since we know theta, omega naught, alpha, and omega, we already have everything for this equation to be able to simply calculate theta, which is what we're looking for. Notice we didn't use the middle equation at all in this particular problem. In other problems, you might. Your quiz is to solve this problem. This concludes this video.